welcome in everyone. We're just going to wait a couple more moments before we get started. All right, the web stream has started. Thank you, David. Welcome everyone. This is our final sustainability speaker series of the 2020 to 2021 cycle. We have Karen and Mark here to talk trash with all of you. So we're really excited. Um, we're just gonna wait a couple moments while people are logging on um, and then we'll get started soon. All right, um, so I think we will get started. We're gonna start our event tonight with a couple of interactive poll questions. So to begin, let's see. Um, if you all have a second device such as a cell phone or you wanna open up another tab on your computer and go to www.menti.com um, just pull up that website and then you can enter in the code that's listed at the top of the screen. So that is 61741873. And that access code will get you into our polling system for tonight's event. Um, we just have a couple of polls. Want to see, test your knowledge at the beginning of this event. So our first question for all of you is what is Sunnyvale's greenhouse gas reduction target by 2030? So these numbers at the bottom are percentages. So is it 25%, 56%, or 80% of 1990 levels? So take a couple minutes, give it your best guess, and then we will let you know the answer. I'll wait a little bit so that people can log in. I know Menti can take a minute to load. Okay, it's looking like a lot of you all think 56%. Got some more votes coming in. All right, well, we'll move along to the next question. So the correct answer is 56%. There it is. Um, yes, the correct answer is 56%. So for those of you who said that, you are correct. Um, we'll move on to our next slide. So just to kind of explain that a little bit more, it was a bit of a trick question um, because 80% is our 2050 target. So currently Sunnyvale is 25% below our 1990 greenhouse gas emissions levels. And like I mentioned, our target by 2030 is to further reduce that by 56%. And then in 2050, we wanna to get to 80% below. And our climate action playbook lays out the path for how we aim to achieve these targets through six key strategies that outline the overarching approach for bold climate action. And there are 18 plays within those strategies that identify those key areas for action and those measurable targets that we'll use to achieve those goals. So you can check out the Climate Action Playbook and Scoreboard um, online, and we will send out a link um, after this event to check out more information on the scoreboard. But I will take us to our next poll which is what percentage of Sunnyvale's total greenhouse gas emissions is attributed to solid waste? So again, um, that's out of our total greenhouse gas emissions, what percentage of those emissions are attributed to solid waste specifically? And if you're joining late, again, you can go to menti.com 
and use the code 61741873 to log on and join our polling. All right, we've got some votes coming in. Looks like it's a close one between 7% and 12%. Give it a couple more minutes. Great, okay, let's find out the answer. And the answer is 7%. So what does that mean exactly? So as you can see, um, this is our 2019 community-wide greenhouse gas emissions breakdown. And so that grain slice, that 7% is solid waste, which is um, what we were just talking about in that last quiz question. Um, and so that's important to note because in 2018, um, this number was only 6%. So this slice has actually increased by 1%, um, and it was 1% overall and actually 17% increase in greenhouse gas emissions from solid waste um, between the two years. And so that's really important to note because this is obviously overall we want to be reducing these emissions and so in this category specifically we actually went up and so we want to be really attentive to that and figure out ways to further reduce that number. So our next quiz question is how much trash do you think the average Sunnyvale resident produces in a single year? So we have an eighth of a ton, a fourth of a ton, half of a ton, or two thirds of a ton. And we have the pound equivalents if you're not as familiar with tons. So some boats coming in, a lot of half a tons. Again, if you're joining late, we're just doing some quick um, polling to kind of get engaged at the beginning of this event. We'll leave a couple more seconds before I show the answer. All right, and the answer is two thirds of a ton. That's a lot of waste in one year per resident. Um, so we're gonna talk about that tonight. Um, so which of these is recyclable is our next question. So is it a hot to go cup, a milk carton, an egg carton or a frozen food box? So vote for which you think can be recycled. Okay, lots of egg cartons and milk cartons. Kind of fun to see the votes coming in, those little dots. <laughs> All right, got a couple frozen food and hot to go, but mostly the cartons, milk cartons winning. Okay, let's see what the answer is. Which of these is actually recyclable? It is the milk carton. So if you voted for that, you are correct. None of the other things are recyclable. So lastly, why should we keep food scraps out of the landfill? This will be our last quiz question before we get into the event. We want to know why do you think we should keep scraps out of the landfill? All right, and the answers are coming in. Got a lot of all of the above. Is it because we can turn them into electricity? Because they create methane, which leads up climate change? Are we just trying to get to zero waste? What's the correct answer? Is it all of these? All right, and the correct answer is 
all of the above. So any and all of these are correct. Um, we want to get to a zero waste goal of 90% diversion by 2030. We also want to um, reduce methane emissions from food scrap degradation, which does speed up climate change. And we can also use food scraps to make electricity and fertilizer. So back to the event, um, we just want to let you know that we do have Zoom subtitles and transcriptions. You might be seeing these on the bottom of your screen. Um, if you want to see the full transcript of the event, you can select live transcript and view full transcript. Or if you wanna hide those subtitles and you don't wanna see them, you can select live transcript and then hide subtitle. So that's just a little accessibility feature in case you need that. And now I will pass it over to Commissioner Shayna Paget, who is going to introduce our speakers and give you a little introduction to this event. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining us for this virtual sustainability speaker series event, Talk of Trash, Myths and Realities of Recycling and Materials Management. Just a quick background on the sustainability speaker series. This series brings renowned experts in sustainability research and policy development to share their ideas and innovations with our community. The 2021 theme is Playbook Strategies in line with the City Council's 2019 adoption of the Climate Action Playbook and the Council priority of accelerating climate action. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the City's website in the following weeks. Attendees can type questions into the chat at any point during the event, and they will be answered during the Q&A session. This will occur in the last 30 minutes of the event. Questions will not be visible to the audience until they are answered. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. We value your feedback. Please fill out the evaluation form on Google Forms after the event. The link will be posted in the chat and it will also be emailed to those who registered on Eventbrite after the event. I'd like to in introduce our guests tonight. We have Mark Bowers. Mark's involvement with the recycling program started at the time of the first Earth Day. I don't wanna say when that was, but I remember I was in the fourth grade. He went on to co-found EcoCycle, the largest recycling nonprofit in the county. He then ran community-based recycling operations at Arcata, California, and then in Bend, Oregon. Mark moved into the public sector to manage Mountain View's recycling and solid waste disposal systems. Since 1990, Mark has managed Sunnyvale's solid waste program. Karen Gisable is the Environmental Programs Manager for Sunnyvale's Environmental Services Department. Karen has a master's degree in public health from San Jose State and a BA from San Francisco State in health education. She has been with Sunnyvale for 11 years, managing the SMART station and implementing the city's zero waste strategic plan. Her current project is to collect every scrap of food from all residents and businesses in Sunnyvale to comply with the new mandatory food scraps collection law. Welcome everyone to tonight's program. Thank you, Shanna. And now we will pass it over to Mark and Karen. I will stop sharing my screen and they will get into their presentation. Hey, this is Mark and I'm going to lead off tonight. And uh, before I get started on our actual presentation, I wanna give a little update on that bio and let you know that I have retired uh, back in 2019 as the division manager. And I wanna give a shout out to David Kruger who has taken over the solid waste programs division manager job earlier this year. He's doing a great job. He's a quick study 
and uh, was uh, brought over from San city of San Ramon. Um, we, he is a star in our world, in our recycling world, because he's the president of the Northern California Recyclers Association. So uh, it's a great catch and uh, I want you to look forward to him doing some good work for the city. No pressure, David, no pressure. Um, so what we're gonna do is, is I'm gonna uh, start off and uh, talk about, if you can flip to the next slide, Karen. Karen's running the slides. Trying to, does not seem to be forwarding. There we go. There you go. So we're gonna talk about the history of recycling in Sunnyvale, which goes back further than you might suspect. Why plastics are so complicated. Um, what wish cycling is and why it's a problem. And then Karen's gonna move into um, updating you on Sunnyvale's uh, new policies on single use plastics. Uh, an update on the state food scraps recycling law and uh, how that's coming together here and uh, what each of us can do to, re to reduce waste. So if we can move to the next slide, um, talk a little bit and you know, so what does landfill have to do with recycling? Um, good question. And actually in the olden days, in the previous century, uh, there actually was quite a bit of recycling that went on uh, prior to World War II and actually a lot in World War II because resources were short. And uh, how garbage was handled in Sunnyvale was from about 1912 to 1993, the site out on the north uh, side of Caribbean Drive at the very northern tip of the city was used for uh, disposal, first by private operators and they would uh, drive the stuff out there. And that's where the recycling was happening back in those days. They would have the collectors sorting rags and scrap metals and uh, food scraps would go to pigs. And um, uh, what else were they sorting out? Uh, bones. And uh, then everything else they threw in a pile and set on fire. Um, and so obviously at some point during the middle part of the, night of the 20th century, that setting on fire part became a problem and uh, no longer was allowed. And um, the other thing that changed in the middle of the last century was that after World War II, the consumer boom generated so much waste material that the, the collectors uh, just were overwhelmed and couldn't sort because the, the volume grew so large and they just sort of threw their hands up and everything just went into what became known as a sanitary landfill. Uh, but, but recycling uh, was a big deal even back in those days. Um, now around 1960 here in Sunnyvale, the city started playing a bigger role um, and took over control of the system in, in some ways from the private sector. And the city began buying up parcels on that north side of Caribbean Drive that you're familiar with, with uh, the smart station of the water pollution control plan out there and started controlling the collection side with a city regulated franchise. And um, then in the 1980s, uh, the tighter state and federal regulations on environmental issues, air quality, water quality, uh, became a big deal. And it made it very difficult and expensive for um, cities and counties to operate these small municipal landfills. And um, in 1993 uh, was a date when Sunnyvale, along with thousands of other uh, jurisdictions, closed their landfills and just got out of that business and, and started contracting for that service. So we in anticipation of that 1993 date, the city uh, signed a contract with waste management for disposal at Kirby Canyon Landfill in San Jose and began the process of building the smart station, the Sunnyvale Materials Recovery and Transfer Station and opened that up uh, on October 1st of 1993, the day after the landfill closed. Next slide, please. So recycling in Sunnyvale. Back in 1992, was uh, roughly the start of a resident led bag bundle and curb recycling program. All volunteer uh, citizens who, who were excited about recycling and wanted to see it happen. And you see photo there on the left of the containers that were used. The metal cans were the trash cans and uh, the burlap sacks were what were used for holding the bottles and cans and then newspapers were bundled. And um, at some point in the mid eighties, the city pick, started picking up the collections and you see those the trucks that were used down in the bottom right of the screen, um, a truck towing a trailer and a lot of sorting done on route, glass sorted by color, brown, green, clear, and so forth. Um, and then uh, that collection function was turned over to the garbage company in 91. 
started picking up yard trimmings in 94, got the, the materials recovery facility at the smart station opened the same year, started applying more and more use of technology uh, to um, sort and process, adding materials uh, periodically as we went along. Uh, and then the big change recently was in 2011, we moved into commercial food scraps collection and then in 2017, residential food scraps collection. That kind of brings us up to date, except for the, the going forward stuff that Carol will talk about later. Um, so you can see it, numerically how the diversion rate has changed uh, since 1990. And uh, we did a big study with, um, with a consultant on how much was generated within the city limits and what was landfill and what was recycled. And, the state official calculation from that came back as 18% was being diverted. Diversion including source reduction, like using cloth diapers or printing your, your uh, uh, reports double-sided instead of single-sided, those counted, uh, refillable bottles. Um, then uh, you fast forward to 2019 and the number is at about 63%. And that's a soft number, the statistics that underlie it you know, if, you, if you're familiar with statistics, you'd give it a large standard deviation, you know, five or 10%. So it's 63 plus or minus eight, 63 plus or minus 10 maybe. So don't, don't focus too much on that number. It's how it changes over time that's important. And then the goals that the council has set, the city council has set um, are in 2020, uh, we were supposed to hit 75% and it uh, doesn't look like we're gonna make that, but we're getting close with 63 and we've been a little higher in some previous years. Uh, and then in 2030, there's a, a, uh, an aspirational number of 90%, which would depend on some use of technologies that the state right now won't allow, uh, getting into things like energy recovery that are pretty controversial. Um, so the 90% number is an aspirational goal that would require changes to state law, state regulations, and um, community attitudes, to be quite frank with you, uh, not just in Sunnyvale, but throughout the state. So here's what's going on today. This is a gorgeous shot of a specialty collection truck unloading. And um, as the contract, former contract manager, I'm just delighted to see such a nice clean truck with a good paint job. That's all part of contract compliance. And um, so we talk in the first bullet point, smart processes, a thousand tons per day of trash and recyclables and uh, serve Sunnyvale, Mountain View and Palo Alto, the current smart station partners. So the word process, you might wonder, well, what does process mean? So I've got a little uh, explanation on that. So it's a bunch of different functions, actually. We, we take in at SMART garbage and recyclables that are collected by specialty from residents and businesses. And we take in smaller amounts that are delivered by city crews, individual residents and self haulers like gardeners, remodeling contractors, and so on. Uh, but more than 90% of what comes in the door at SMART is delivered by the three franchised haulers that serve Sunnyvale, Mountain View, and Palo Alto. So that's one process. Then we take in the source separated yard trimmings, grind them to reduce the volume and ship them to the ZBES compost site near Gilroy. Take in the source separated recyclables, process them, clean them up, and prepare them uh, to be shipped to markets in both the US and overseas. We'll, we'll see a picture of that, a photo of that here in a minute. Um, and then from the garbage, this is the thing that, that got the smart station on CNN when it was brand new um, and, and ABC News and all sorts of uh, uh, media around the world, in fact. Uh, in fact uh, we sort recyclables and organics from the garbage itself. Um, and we truck the unrecycled portion down to the Kirby Canyon landfill, which is a 34 mile round trip uh, using a big rig, but it's that that mechanical um, enhanced separation of recyclables and organics uh, from the garbage. And, and we're hitting numbers right now that over 30% of what comes in the door as garbage is actually able to be diverted in some way. And we're talking low value stuff, concrete, wood, um, big chunks of um, stuff like that. And um, some car cardboard, um, things that are tough to pick up on a source separated basis. Then, um, if you haven't had a chance to tour the smart station, I would highly recommend it. The pile of garbage is kind of visually overwhelming. You really get a sense of what we're dealing with every day. 
uh, and after the COVID restrictions are lifted, um, the contract requires the contractor to give a tour uh, at least once a week. So those are available. And we also have a uh, video on our website. If you go to sunnyvale.ca.gov, there's a link in the recycling area to a YouTube video. It's about 16 uh, minutes long and it uh, gives a good sense of how the stuff is collected and, and processed and sent off to market. So next slide. Um, what happens to the recyclables after collection? The picture shows bales, uh, you know, think of hay bales or you know, other sorts of things. Uh, big machine uh, crams everything together into a rectangular bundle that's held together with wires and that's a bale. Um, so after the recyclables come in, they're sorted by machines, by hand uh, to clean them up, uh, and make them uh, meet manufacturer specifications so they can be made into new products. Um, and the important point here is we're sending these items to manufacturers. Recycling doesn't happen when you put stuff in your cart. It doesn't happen when specialty picks up the cart. It doesn't happen at the smart station. It happens when this stuff goes to a factory and is made into a new product using an industrial process of some sort. And so to do that, we have to meet the quality specs uh, of those processors. And I, if you rewind back to the, uh, to the um, quiz at the beginning, we gave you those four items that we asked, are these four things recyclable? And the only one that was, was the milk carton. And you're going, well, a lot of you voted for, for egg cartons. And let me explain why an egg carton on the West Coast, I don't consider recyclable. And that's because most of the mixed paper that egg, egg cartons would go with to a paper mill is shipped to Asian paper mills. And in, in Asia, they're very conscious of uh, things like SARS and other viruses that jump from poultry into humans and create uh, pandemics like the one we're seeing right now with COVID-19. So they're very jumpy about anything associated with poultry, including egg cartons, worried that there's somehow some viral contamination could, could um, spread disease over in their part of the world. And uh, they can't tell when a bale comes in the door, whether it's an American egg carton or a Vietnamese egg carton or a Chinese egg carton. And so the rule from the buyers is we don't want egg cartons. And other than that, the egg carton is perfectly recyclable. So it's, a, it's an example of how the market um, is responding in a non-technical fashion as far as breaking down paper and making new paper. If we ship the egg cartons to Minnesota to a paper mill, they'd be perfectly acceptable to that mill because we don't have the same poultry human interaction to worry about. Anyway, going on a bit long about that, but that's, that's why the, um, so it was somewhat of a trick question on the uh, egg carton. Um, so moving along. So you've heard there were challenges recently with recycling markets. What's that about? And so this gets into a long bit of myth making uh, where for about 20 years, China, Chinese buyers would buy just about anything we ship to them. And so you could make a bale. And I, I don't, when I say we, I don't mean Sunnyvale. Sunnyvale was not shipping mixed plastics to China. I want to be real clear about that. Um, our plastics have always gone to buyers here in California. Um, but across the, the entire world, Europe, Australia, all the, all the industrialized countries were shipping this type of material to China with willing sellers, willing buyers, that's great, huh? Well, on the Chinese end, they didn't really want 100% of what they were getting. They wanted certain types. And so they would sort those out. And then um, what they didn't want, uh, they did some environmentally detrimental things with. They would uh, uh, burn it sometimes to generate power, sometimes just to get rid of it, creating air pollution, They'd leave it in big piles that would blow around the landscape or blow into waterways. And after a couple of decades of this going on, the Chinese government was getting conscious and getting hammered by its own residents uh, and, and said, this is not acceptable behavior. We don't want to have our country uh, damaged by this uh, economic transaction that's going on. And so you can't do this anymore. You can't import mixed plastics, raw plastics from other parts of the world. And they threw waste paper, which we, we call recyclables, uh, collecting paper, waste paper on our end, and it, so it reads as garbage when you translate it. 
So through the, the entire uh, recycling market for both of those categories uh, into a huge uproar for several years now, things are finally getting a little bit straightened out. Um, so that, that the big myth though on our end of the pipeline was I can throw all this stuff in my car, it goes to China, it gets recycled. Well, it wasn't true then and it isn't true now. And so we have to, we're asking our, our residents and, and everyone in the community to be much more careful about what they put in the, in the recycling cart because the most damaging thing you can do is put in the cart something that's bad that you have to spend your money retrieving and then sending it off to landfill instead of sending it straight to disposal. So um, the, the Chinese government accomplished uh, this change in the market was something they called the national sword, China national sword in 2018. It basically bans uh, foreign recyclables from coming in in their raw form and uh, set an unrealistic, an, an un, incredibly low contamination limit. 0.5% is literally unattainable in most recycling processes. So moving on. Why does that present challenges? Well, we've had to find other markets, not just the US, but Europe, Australia, like I said, all the industrialized countries have been, have been in a huge scramble looking for where do we now recycle this material or can we even recycle it? Um, so we're looking to have that um, contamination cleaned up here at the source. And uh, if we move on to the next slide, the industry response was that the recycling industries are moving out of China. They can't buy what they need. They still need to make boxes in China, but they can't make it make those boxes from imported paper from the US. So what they're doing is moving mills sometimes into the United States. We've got a large Chinese paper company that's bought up several mills uh, here in our country that were closed down or underutilized and it's kind of spiffed them up and they're, and they're taking our American waste paper and making a pulp product and shipping the pulp product to China because that's allowed. And that's happening in a number of countries. And, and I saw um, statistics recently that whereas China was the number one importer of US uh, scrap paper for 20 years, uh, it's now number nine on the list. India is the largest importer now. Uh, and ahead of China are South Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and some others. So China really has done what it said it was gonna do. It is not taking our scrap paper and it's not taking our scrap plastics anymore. So here we get to the, the plastics are complicated thing. And let's see if we can do this with a minimum of words and, and understand there's a lot of conflicting um, motivations and agendas here uh, from different players in the picture. The plastics industry is one of those players. And what does the plastics industry want? It wants to sell plastics. And um, it competes in the marketplace, plastic does, with paper and uh, glass and aluminum and steel and, and other product types. Um, so to make plastic look like a groovy, recyclable commodity, the plastics industry got this great idea to put numbers with recycling triangles, symbols around them on the bottoms of all the containers. And in fact, they went out and got a bunch of state legislatures, including California's, to require that these markings be on those containers. So that you, the consumer, go to the grocery store, you look on the shelf, and if you're a conscientious consumer, you look, is this a, is this a good container or a bad container? You turn it up and you look at the bottom, oh, it's got a recycling triangle. It's, it's good, I should be able to buy this and not feel bad about it. That's the whole purpose of the recycling triangle thing, or 90% of it. There is some, some help to understanding when we're, when we're sorting and processing which polymer we're looking at, whether it's polyethylene terephthalate, number one, high density polyethylene, number two, and so forth. Um, so now some of the states have figured this out. California is reversing course and saying you, you are not required. In fact, we may not allow you to put the, the numbered triangles on your, your bottles and containers anymore for plastics. Um, but that that's the, the whole uh, idea that the plastics industry had when they put this system into place. Next slide. So the problem with the plastics codes are that the resin codes oversimplify and they're not a reliable indicator of whether or not the item's recyclable. That's, that's another problem. Um, 
and most single-use plastics are not accepted in recycling markets like are pictured in the, in the uh, person's hand in the photo, straws and so forth. So we need legislation, it's happening, we need a, a level playing field here to clarify what's really going on to create markets for the plastics and or just ban problem packaging. And there's various bills in the legislature in Sacramento right now attacking different um, approaches in that. And here's an example of why number one uh, doesn't work. On the left, you have a very recyclable water or soda bottle. If you look at the code on the bottom, it's number one. That can be recycled, it's flexible. If you put it in your hand and try to crinkle it, it's, you know, it's moldable, you can change the shape. If you look on the right side, we call these thermoforms or thermosets. It's the very same polymer, polyethylene terephthalate, number one, but it goes through a different process when it's made into this strawberry basket configuration and it takes a rigid form. It's heated up more, I think, when it's processed. And so it takes this form, which is very difficult to recycle because that plastic wants to stay in that form. Even if you shred it into chips, uh, the chips will have a, a shape to them that um, is very difficult to get them to go back and conform um, uh, and become something like a soda bottle. It just doesn't work. So it's just an example of um, why the, the number one uh, designation oversimplifies in this particular instance and why it's so very hard to interpret to people in the public, everyone on this broadcast and uh, everyone out in the community who's paying less attention. It's just, a, you just don't have enough bandwidth to understand all the plastic stuff. And, and so we've oversimplified in the past. Some people have oversimplified and made you think that all of this stuff can go in your recycling cart when it's really not all getting recycled. So, um, So the, I think, is this where we have you take over, Karen? I can't see the slide numbers. You have one more. One more, okay. So uh, this is just some points, probably can hit these quickly, why plastics are bad. Most of these are obvious, that production harms the environment, there's energy use. Um, and, and it's an important point to, to remember in the United States, almost all of these plastics are made from natural gas. Uh, other parts of the world, they may be made from petroleum and they can technically be made from plants, uh, but most of it's made from natural gas, which is really, really, really cheap right now. Um, and so you, you pull the gas out of the ground and you run it through leaky pipelines and leaky valves and pump stations. Uh, so a lot of the methane gets emitted into the atmosphere. You make a product that's used sometimes only for seconds uh, before it's discarded and um, then it's gone. So it's it, 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 I call it carbon mining in the same sense that you would mine coal, make electricity from it, the electricity is used in an instant, and then you've still got this carbon load going into the atmosphere. The same thing is happening with these single-use plastics. You're pulling the plastic out of the ground and using it for just a, a few seconds or minutes, or a little bit longer sometimes, and then boom, it's gone, and, and it's very almost valueless, and you have all this waste to get rid of. Uh, very little is recycled and much of it ends up as litter uh, on land and in the ocean. And uh, that's that. So turning it over to Karen now. Okay. So as you heard from Mark, um, plastics are pretty darn complicated. Um, they're hard to recycle. They cause a lot of problems with production and at the end of their life. So you're probably wondering what's Sunnyvale doing to address some of the problems. Um, so actually last month, uh, city council approved a new ordinance to address some of the single use plastic challenges. Um, the ordinance has two phases. Uh, for the first phase, when people order food for takeout or delivery, they'll need to now opt in or ask for the utensils, chopsticks, condiments, all those annoying things that you get in the bag, whether you ask for it or not. Um, and this will really reduce the amount of those types of items that we don't really need most of the time because we take that food home or it gets delivered to our front door and we don't, we don't need to use those items. Um, so this um, phase would go into effect the end of this year or the beginning of next. And then for the second phase, which would be um, sometime in 2022 or 23, uh, we'd require food service providers to only provide accessory items. And that's things like straws, stir sticks, uh, and the plugs, those annoying little plugs that go in your coffee lid. 
um, to be on request only. So you'd have to ask for them when you go to order something um, from a restaurant or takeout. And then we go back to council in 2023 with further, recommend, further recommendations that we might have on ways to continue reducing single-use plastics. So you might be wondering with all the complexities of recycling, what actually is recyclable in Sunnyvale? Um, so a few years ago, we actually developed a list that simply and clearly spells out what we do accept and a list of items of things we don't accept. So we call the acceptable ones, the nice nine. And these are the things that we want you to put in your recycling cart. So we really tried to simplify the list of things we take. Um, as Mark said before, there's a lot of things that we don't, we don't take. Um, so we simplified the list. Um, and since plastics and paper items are really the most confusing in terms of recyclability, we, like I said, we put them in really simple categories. So for example, in number one, you, um, it says plastic bottles and it shows images of items like detergent, condiment, soda, and water bottles. And then for number four, um, it says plastic tubs. And these are things like yogurt, butter, and sour cream tubs. And for this list, we removed all the references to the chasing arrows for the reasons Mark indicated previously. The, the chasing arrow doesn't really tell us whether it's recyclable or not. It was really confusing people more than anything. So we just removed those references. And then for uh, paperboard number nine, um, this includes things like cereal and tissue boxes, not frozen food boxes. So pretty much anything that doesn't fit into these categories are considered the bad guys. And we call the bad guys the dirty dozen. And we want you to keep these items out of the recycling cart. Um, so for plastic, these are things like clamshells, black plastic, hot and cold cups, and plastic bags. And for paper items, you can see that the egg carton, which some of you thought was recyclable, and it really it is recyclable, but not in Sunnyvale for the reasons Mark explained. Um, frozen food boxes, which a lot of people think are, is, uh, are recyclable, but they've got a coating on them to keep water from making it soggy. Um, and takeout containers, even the compostable ones, we don't take those in our recycling or our food scraps, which I'll get into in a minute. So all of these items go into the trash and um, there aren't markets for these materials and they also contaminate um, our good recyclables. So you probably have heard of this, but what do you call it when people put these items into their recycling cart? What do you call it? We call it wish cycling. So that's, that's what happens when we're at home and you're standing in front of the recycling cart or the garbage cart and you're trying to figure out what where this item goes. Um, and a lot of times we just put the material into the recycling bin with the hopes that someone, somewhere, somehow uh, will separate these items and find a way to recycle them. But I'm here to tell you with complete confidence that there is no wish cycle fairy who can actually handle these items. I know it's pretty disappointing. We wish there was a wish cycle fairy too who could take care of everything. But the truth is that all of the items in the dirty dozen list um, that get placed in the recycling bin uh, don't get recycled. Uh, things like straws, plastic utensils, the clamshells, to-go boxes, greasy pizza boxes, and even garden hoses. We get the whole gamut um, and we don't want them. Um, all of these items have to be sorted out of the recycling stream when they come into the smart station. Um, and it takes a whole lot of staff time and labor to separate them and then they just end up in the landfill. So our rule of thumb is when in doubt, throw it out. If you don't know if it's recyclable or not, just toss it in the garbage. Um, and better yet, um, memorize the nice nine and dirty dozen, or you can get a hold of those um, off of our website, which I'll provide at the end of the presentation. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about another item that we do recycle and that's food scraps. We're pretty excited about this program. Sunnyvale has a pretty unique food scraps program um, that's been in place since 2017 for single family households. Um, and for those of you who live in multifamily apartments or condos, you won't have to wait much longer because food scraps is also coming your way starting in 2022. So that's pretty exciting. So our program is unique in that we only accept food. Um, some programs accept food in yard trimmings, but we're the food only program. 
Um, and with the exception of tea bags and coffee filters, we don't take any paper products or compostable foodware items. And that's because our food scraps get turned into fertilizer or they get sent to, an, uh, they get sent to anaerobic digesters and made into energy. Um, neither of those vendors will accept the paper for the production of these materials, of these um, end products. Um, so they really want uh, the food scraps to be kept clean and free of um, any paper. So why should we separate food scraps? Uh, between groceries we don't use and food that goes bad, we actually waste 40% of the food we buy. So that's a huge number. Um, and then as you've heard, and we, you probably know that when the food gets tossed in the trash and then sent to the landfill, it creates methane gas, which is one of the contributors of climate change. We also know that we throw a lot of food away. Um, in, a, in a waste characterization study we did several years ago, we found that residents generate over 8,000 tons annually. And before we started our program, all of that was going to the landfill. Um, we are happy to say that since we started the program, we are now recycling half of those tons. So only 4,000 are going into the landfill, um, but we need to get at those too and make sure that they um, don't end up um, getting disposed. And then finally, there's a new law um, that I'll talk about in a minute, a mandatory food scraps uh, recycling law that um, was recently put in place. So here's some pretty cool metrics showing the positive impact of residents' actions um, who participate in the program. Um, since the inception of the program in 2017, we've recycled 14,000 tons of food scraps, which is a huge number. We've managed to reduce garbage sent to the landfill by 18%, which is also huge. Uh, food cycle eliminates 2,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide each year, which is the same thing as taking 472 cars off the road annually. So we're very pleased um, with the program so far, and we've made great headway, but we have more to do, as always. Um, we know not everyone participates in the program, so we are always trying to find out you know, what's going on? Why do people like it? Why don't they like it? Um, so we do a lot of surveys. Uh, we conducted a survey in 2018, right after the program started. And then we actually did another one um, last month. Um, and the surveys um, tell us for people who find them challenging that there's uh, the reasons why they find challenges with it is that there's a lack of space in their kitchen for the food scrap pail on the counter. Some people don't like the ick, the ick factor is a problem, um, odors from the pail, or they're concerned about um, odors maybe from the pail leaving the food scraps on the counter. Um, some people are worried about having a dirty food scraps cart. Um, and some people are concerned that they may not remember to separate it. And it just ends up, you know, they end up putting it in the garbage. They don't have a system set up. So we have just launched a new food cycle outreach campaign in order to help residents understand the program better and to overcome some of the challenges um, they have with it. Um, we've developed some videos and ads and social media posts um, that will provide um, specific tips and tricks to address some of the barriers to participation. And our goal, of course, is to increase our tons and to increase our participation. Uh, the bottom line message we wanna put out there is that we want all your food scraps every week as much as you can give us. We'll take it all. Another concern people have had with the program is the cart design. Um, as you can see, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is a split cart similar to the single family recycling cart. Um, so in this um, cart, 70% is for garbage and 30% is for food scraps. Um, most people feel the garbage side is too small and the food side is too big. Um, so when we completed our pilot study of the program back in 2016, um, we worked with our, the, our, actually our garbage hauler was responsible for finding an appropriate cart to use to expand the program. Um, so they went to the manufacturer to design the best cart they could. There weren't any other programs like this out there. So it was something that they were really starting from scratch. Um, and we were kind of, Think, you know, when we did the pilot, it was a 50-50 split and clearly the food scrap side was way too big. So we were thinking maybe do an 80-20. 
Um, but when we started working with the manufacturer, they informed us that this would end up um, contaminate, we would end up with con contamination from the garbage falling into the food side of the cart when the truck uh, lifts the cart up and dumps it into the truck. It lifts it up, you know, the, the um, lids flip open, food goes on one side, garbage on the other. So if they're too close together, um, they were concerned that the garbage would tip over into the food scrap side and contaminate it. So they felt that the 70-30 split was the best design available. And so that's why we um, have the 70-30 split. We've looked at adding an insert to reduce the side of the food, uh, the food side of the cart and increase the garbage side of the cart um, prior to COVID. Um, but the manufacturer, um, uh, actually the manufacturer went out of business during COVID, but other manufacturers we've talked to about this basically won't touch a redesign of a cart unless they have a huge volume. So they need like at least 200,000 carts to be you know, redesigned and reconfigured for them to even talk to us. And in Sunnyvale, we only have 30,000 carts and we've already expended you know, millions of dollars to put them out there. So we were trying to find a simple solution. And so far that hasn't panned out, but we are continuing to look at other options potentially you know, maybe adding a fourth cart size, um, or we're actually looking at, you know, finding 3D solution where, you know, they can make a 3D insert and we could test that out in the field. So we're looking, we're, you know, we're continually looking for other options for the cart because we know it is a little bit frustrating for some folks. So um, residents aren't, aren't the only ones who are recycling food scraps. Um, our businesses are also um, doing their job as well. And we have over 60% of our businesses are already recycling their food scraps. And they've been doing that since 2011. Uh, we started collecting way back then. And you can see there's been an increase in tons collected each year. It's gone up, 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 um, which has been great. Um, and of course, then COVID hit and uh, the tons plummeted because, you know, all the businesses, restaurants um, were closed or operating um, at less capacity. So our, as you can see, our peak tonnage was around 4,400 tons, and we are hoping to get back up to that as the impacts of COVID are reduced. And I mentioned previously that there's a new mandatory food scraps law. This is better known as the short-lived climate pollutant law, um, Senate Bill uh, 1383. Um, the purpose of this bill is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, from a variety of pollutants, including landfill gas, which we've been talking about a lot. Um, and that's generated from organic waste and other material that um, decomposes in the landfill. Uh, the law establishes several statewide goals by 2025, including a reduction in the amount of organic material disposed in landfills by 75%, and the recovery of currently disposed edible food for human consumption. So there's a lot of food um, that uh, caterers and corporations that have cafeterias um, have perfectly good food that can be um, collected um, and distributed to folks who need it. So the law is pretty ambitious and we've got uh, lots of staff working on that right now. Um, the law actually requires uh, mandatory food scraps for single family homes. Um, we're good there. We already implemented our food scraps program in 2017, all multifamily households. And this will be new for 2022. We're hoping to kick off a new program starting in January. Um, and then commercial sites, um, as I mentioned before, we already have around 60% of our businesses on board. Those are the medium to large size businesses. So we'll be um, talking to all the small to medium, other medium sized businesses, businesses that are not on board already. And then also yard trimmings from multifamily and commercial sites that are not currently sending um, theirs to be composted. And then, as I mentioned, the edible food recovery. So as we come to the end of the presentation, you might be asking what actions you can take to reduce waste. So here's just a few we'll mention before we're done. Um, the first one is to recycle right. Uh, we talked a lot about that. Uh, put only the items that are really recyclable in your recycling cart, toss the rest in the garbage. No, risk, no wish cycling, please. Uh, recycle all your food scraps every week so we can keep them out of the landfill. When you're purchasing produce or other items, search for items um, with less or no packaging. Um, 
And then when you have um, containers that you're getting ready to recycle, especially water bottles, make sure you empty those of liquids um, before you put them in the recycling bin. Um, because they end up coming out to the smart station and if the lid's not removed, um, they can't really do anything with it. And then sometimes the container actually gets smashed and then whatever's in the container gets all over everything else and makes a mess of it. And so then, um, you know, a lot of material gets contaminated and has to be um, sent to the landfill. Shop in bulk if you can. Most stores offer bulk bins um, or they will once COVID allows them to refill the bins again. Um, you can bring your own containers um, or you can use paper bags that the store provides. You can refuse plastics you don't need, whether with takeout or at the coffee shop or the straw in your drink glass. If you don't need it, um, just refuse it. And then finally, bring your own containers, your own coffee cup or your own containers when you go out to dinner. If you've got um, extra food that, you know, if you can't finish your meal, um, you can just put that in your own plastic container. I did go to a coffee shop today and they, they would not allow me to bring my reusable cup. So that's kind of slow to come back, but pretty soon it, I'm sure it will be. So that's pretty much it. Um, we Here's some information on some of the things we mentioned. Uh, if you go to our website and search Nice Nine and Dirty Dozen, it'll take you right to the page that has way more information about um, mostly the Dirty Dozen, why we don't accept some of those materials. Um, and there's the flyers that you can print out and post on your refrigerator. Um, and if you wanna know more about food scraps recycling, we just updated our page and it shows how you can get to the videos which are on the YouTube channel, which is listed below here. And here's the Facebook page um, with lots of good information. And finally, our phone number. So we hope you have a better idea now of the history of trash and recycling and why recycling is so complicated, um, how to recycle right, and how to reduce your use of plastics and other materials. And all of this, of course, we're doing to help meet Sunnyvale Zero Waste Goal of 75% by 2025 and 90% by 2030. So thank you very much for listening. We really appreciate you being here. And I believe we now have time for some questions. Yes, thank you so much, Karen. Um, I'm just going to spotlight all three of us. All right, looks like I can't spotlight all three of us, so I will move myself. Should I unshare? Uh, yes, that'd be great. So, or yeah, I can just take over. Um, so now we have time for our Q&A. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping, remember to type your questions into the Q&A box. Our team, myself, will read them out to Mark and Karen to answer. Um, and then as you probably have noticed, we also have Sunnyvale staff typing answers to some questions um, as well. And we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible before the event ends at 8.30. If we are unable to get to your question, you can always email us at greenap or at green at sunnyvale.ca.gov. Um, that's our answer point email. So I will pull up the questions and start asking them. Um, so our first question is, what is the city doing to require retailers, manufacturers, and other responsible parties to enable recycling of their products or to change their product deliveries? I can take that one on, um, and and this is uh, Bill's actually uh, included in his question in concert with other cities, which is a really important part uh, because one city by itself, uh, especially one as uh, small in the bigger picture as Sunnyvale, uh, doesn't quite have the the clout to to get into those types of processes. We do uh, very actively at the city. Um, uh, lobby for legislation at the state level and um, work on them being required to have certain minimum quantity uh, of recycled content in the products that they put out. That's um, a, a tactic that can really help create markets for these materials. Uh, right now, the big problem with plastics is that um, natural gas is so cheap that when you're, say, a company making plastic bottles, you look at how cheaply you can make them from 
uh, natural gas, the virgin product, compared to the recycled version, and it's always going to be cheaper. And so, unless there's a, there's a mandate from a, a state level or higher to use a recycled content uh, bottle in that example, um, it just won't happen naturally. Um, so, so I think our our work collaboratively at the county level, encouraging other cities also to lobby the legislature and and uh, take that on is probably the biggest single thing the city can do. Gotcha, thank you for that answer. Um, all right, so we have another question. Why can we not recycle styrofoam and what happens to it? One of my favorite topics, again, this is Mark again, um, you can technically recycle styrofoam and it, it does happen in limited ways. But if you look at a chunk of styrofoam, think about how much of it is actually is product versus how much of it is air. It's an expanded polystyrene is, is what styrofoam is, is technically called. Um, and it's expanded with air and it's so light that there's no, um, there's no product there. Um, and in order to recover this stuff, you have to move it to a central location where there's equipment necessary to do that. And you can't move that chunk of styrofoam very far before you've burned more fossil fuel than is contained in the product. That's really the essential problem besides all, I mean, there's lots of other issues with, with expanded polystyrene, uh, starting with styrene, which has got some links uh, to, to, to cancer possibly. Um, but it's just an inherently, it, it, do, it does what it does very well, which is be used once and then be thrown away. That, I mean, it was designed for that and it does that very well. And, and you're simply trying to get styrofoam to do something that it wasn't meant to do if, if you try to recycle it in most instances. And actually when we were, we did a long time ago, we, we were really trying to see if we could start a, a program to recycle it and what we found was that they make the styrofoam into things like picture frames and it's a plastic picture frame. And then as soon as that thing breaks, then it gets thrown away. So it wasn't even being made into something that could be recycled again. Um, so an inherently not a product um, that could be, you know, used again and made into something um, more durable. That's super interesting. Thanks for sharing and answering that question. Um, all right, looks like we have a question about um, the fact that the composting program or the food cycle program only accepts food scraps and not paper towels or other compostable papers. Um, so how does SMART look to deal with compostable takeout containers and how might this play into our single use plastics policy? So we're, <laughs> Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, we are looking at possibly capturing it at the back end and finding ways to um, have it composted with other um, yard trimmings or other materials at the back end. Um, so it would be a different market than the one we use for the front end where, where we're getting this very clean product that's being made into fertilizer and used for energy production. Um, otherwise there's, there's not a lot of use for it, which is why, you know, we're, we're looking at ordinances or bans on, on products that really can't be used, you know, again, more than once. Um, so that's why reusables, bringing your own cups and things like that is really the best option. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Mark. Sure. Um, we talked a little bit about the smart station and the smart station is presently going through a redesign process because uh, it's starting to show its age. It's been operating for about 28 years. And one of the concepts that uh, is coming out is recovery from the sort line of compostable paper. And we in fact have a um, procurement that was done for a bunch of different organic materials, uh, trying to get some long-term market commitments from, from people for taking our food scraps and our, and our um, yard trimmings and other things like that. And one of the products that we have a commitment from a compost facility for and a price for is compostable paper that would come out of the um, out of the garbage sort line, be shredded to a specified size 
and then sent off to a compost outcome. Now, paper doesn't compost all that well. Um, and so what we asked them, you know, quite grilled them, I should say, uh, is exactly how does this work and what happens when, it, when you run it through the compost process and it comes out the other end and it's still paper. And they said, well, they put it back to the start. They recycle back and to, from the rear end of the compost process back to the front, you know, as many times as it takes to actually get it to break down. Um, and uh, so we, we think it's real and we're, we're trying to build that technical capability into the recovery system at SMART and we should be taking to council pretty soon um, an award of contract for that um, that specifies a long-term market and price. Gotcha, thank you for that update. That's super interesting. Um, so our next question is, are all hinged plastics thermoformed or are square-sided clear boxes such as salad greens containers recyclable? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Yeah. They're, when, they're, when they have a, a, a specific customized form like that, aside from the bottles, uh, bottles and jars, um, those things like the big salad containers are thermosets and thermoforms. And, and just there's no market for that material. Um, when we talk about, we should be put in a more positive sense. What can we take? Because I think people forget sometimes um, items that can be recycled in the cart are things like your um, liquid detergent bottles, shampoo bottles. Um, a lot of household products um, come in in bottles and jars that are plastic that can go into your recycling cart. So it's stuff you might not generate every day, but um, you know every three months you. you empty a vitamin bottle um, and that, that can go in your recycling cart. Great, yeah, that's a great reminder that there are many things that can be recycled. Um, all right, so our next question, um, this is directed to Mark. On the note of methane leaks and use, does Sunnyvale have any plans to push our landfill to use captured methane for energy production as opposed to burning it off? Would that be feasible and or economical? A very good question uh, and has been a source of great frustration for me personally over the last 25 or so years. Uh, Kirby Canyon does collect the landfill gas, which they're required to do uh, to meet some very strict um, regional and state and federal uh, methane capture requirements, but they have been just flaring it off uh, to destroy and destroy the, the odors that are created from it. Um, the problem with Kirby, and I've, I've had this conversation with waste management several times, um, is that they can't, they, it's not feasible economically anyway, they say, to make electricity from it. We make electricity from the landfill gas at the Sunnyvale landfill, and we've got our, our load, our consuming entity right next door. That's the water pollution control plant. And so it's a very short distance to move the gas, turn it into electricity and use it. Kirby Canyon sits out kind of in the middle of nowhere, and it's not even close to the distribution system for electricity. So to to lay the lines to connect would be um, not economically feasible waste management uh, believes. The last time I did talk to them, they were, they were um, more positive and said they had engineers working on a solution. Um, that was about a year ago. And, and since I've been retired, I haven't been as close to the issue, but, but um, I know they, have, they are aware of it as a, as a flaw in their overall operating structure there and have been looking at ways to do that. And they do some great energy recovery at other sites, like the Altamont landfill has a massive energy production facility up there. That's the big uh, landfill up in um, Altamont Pass that takes San Francisco's garbage. Um, and they, you know, they do know how to do it where the conditions are right. Kirby, the conditions haven't been right in their opinion so far. Gotcha, super interesting. Thank you for answering that. Um, all right, the next question, there's a couple questions in one. Um, so how are recyclables cleaned before going to the recycling markets? And then how are wish cycled items pulled out? And if they're pulled out, what happens to them? Um, and then of those that are removed or what percentage are like removed because they don't meet those requirements? Well, I, I can take that one if you want, Karen, uh, and chime in if you like. The, the number is around 12 to 14 percent of what goes in the carts in Sunnyvale. I believe 12 to 14 percent right now is stuff that ends up being pulled out 
uh, either mechanically or by hand and put in the garbage stream and sent to the landfill. And that may sound like a large number. It is very low compared to single stream programs. The typical good single stream program is never less than 15% because the single stream carts encourage people to put all kinds of weird stuff in them, bowling balls and garden hoses. I mean, the stories are amazing, lawn chairs. Um, now, and I have talked to operators that talk about single stream uh, programs sometimes ending up with more garbage in the recycling cart than recyclables. And, and I've seen piles at a, at a place over north of Sacramento um, where they have a, a lot of problem with that where if you looked at the pile of recyclables and a pile of garbage next to it, you couldn't tell the difference. They, they both look just like garbage. Um, how are they cleaned up? Um, like I said, there are some, some mechanical uh, devices and it's really some very clever engineering uh, where the, this equipment takes advantage of the shape and um, density, uh, all sorts of, of uh, great uh, engineering solutions to separate. And, and the main separation that's done is separating three-dimensional items from two-dimensional items. And when I say two-dimensional, I mean a piece of cardboard, a sheet of newspaper, uh, paper items primarily. Um, unfortunately, sheets of plastic that come in like some of those plastic Amazon envelopes will go with the paper when you, when you sort by dimension. The three-dimensional things are things like plastic bottles, things that have a, you know, a, a more irregular shape and aren't just flat. And so you, you can run them through these uh, disc screens and so forth and really do some amazing things uh, using the physics of, of um, spinning wheels and, and uh, adjusting the slope angle and things. I'm getting too technical, sorry. Um, and then a lot of it does also boil down to um, uh, workers who use their eyes and, and gloved hands to pull out inappropriate materials and, and clean things up. You don't wash it though. I was wondering if by clean people meant, you know, does it get rinsed off or washed by us? And it does not, we do not wash it before it goes to the market. Um, and it, it uh, I don't, we don't tell people to clean things out like so that it's squeaky clean. Um, there can be some residue left on the containers when they get put in your recycling cart. Thank you for clarifying that, that's helpful. Um, all right, next question. Will handling the nice nine and food be sufficient to satisfy Sunnyvale's waste diversion goals? If not, what are the next likely waste streams to be handled? Well, food is definitely the, the next biggest one. Um, after that, you know, what's left in the waste stream is all those nasty plastics, really. <laughs> um, and, you know, unless the markets for those materials improve, you know, the way we're going to have to keep, you know, digging away at it is to, to either put laws in place to ban material or to get people to change their behavior around how they purchase or to reuse, you know, to use reusables as much as they can. Um, so a lot of it's behavior change um, because, you know, as Mark was talking about, uh, the plastics are pretty complex and it may, you know, we may never see real good markets for those materials. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Mark. No, I think that's good. <laughs> um. All right, so I think we, I think you sort of touched on this already, but with water being a limited resource, should bottles that are greasy or have something like peanut butter in them be thrown in the trash? The way we've always phrased it is if you can live with it for a week, we can live with it. We don't wanna see people spending a lot of water um, washing, washing things and running through the dishwasher and so forth. But, I've, you know, if it's, if it's a bottle that's half full of salad dressing or, you know, kind of, it's a common sense thing. If there's more product in it than there is container, I would say um, throw that one away. Or do a quick rinse, like with milk cartons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, stinky milk cartons are, are a problem, yes. <laughs> All right. Um... Okay, can the paper egg cartons be composted at the smart station or not because you don't accept paper or napkins? We don't compost anything at the smart station. Um, 
if you have a backyard compost bin, you could actually put it in there. Probably would take a while before it actually decomposed unless you had a pretty active pile, but um, it has to go in the garbage or in your backyard pile. We don't take it in our food scraps program and we can't take it at the smart station. Uh, we don't have a compost. We don't have a compost pile out there. Gotcha. Okay, there's a couple questions sort of around um, how to encourage businesses to reduce their use of plastic containers. So someone mentioned Trader Joe's. Um, it, how could we encourage local grocers to reduce um, using plastics or containers? Yeah, Trader Joe's actually has made quite a few changes to their packaging. I don't know if you've noticed, but um, all their tomatoes now come in a paper um, and they got rid of their clamshells for most of the clamshells for the tomatoes and they come with a paper thing. There is a little cellophane um, thing on the top that you just can rip off, but the paper, there you go. The paper can go into the paper cart. Um, and they got a lot of pressure from consumers. Um, so, you know, I would tell your grocery stores if you're tired of seeing all the plastic, there's still a ton of the, the clamshells um, but really you have to put pressure on the, the grocers, um, or work legislatively to make those kinds of changes. Um, I don't know what else, Mark. Let's see if, if I can get on camera here, this is an example of what Karen was talking about. I have my bag of shame with me tonight, uh, with all these, uh, good and bad, um, product examples. This is a good one. This one actually, uh, we found this yesterday in Safeway in the organic section with tomatoes in it. It's a oh, perfectly nice. recyclable cardboard box um, instead, of the, instead of the plastic thermoset box. Um, there is a question I would like to tackle if I can switch topics um, real quickly. Joanne asked a very important question about Clorox bottles and other toxic containing bottles. Um, and what uh, I would say to that is triple rinse that bottle. Just take tap water, rinse it, dump it three times and you should be good. Um, you want to do that with things like, um, I, I mentioned there's some odd things people don't think of. Toilet bowl cleaner comes in a perfectly recyclable bottle, and typically, and you can uh, take that, uh, get, the, get the, cot, the top off it with a pair of pliers and rinse those out three times, and you can put that in your recycling cart. But you don't want to, you want to remember that there are human beings down on the other end uh, dealing with this stuff, uh, so you don't want to send stuff that's dangerous uh, their direction, and, and th thank Joanne for that uh, very important question. And while you're speaking of lids, I know there was a question about lids. Um, we do take lids, um, just remove them from the containers and put them in your recycling cart. Awesome, thank you both for following up on that. Um, so there's a question about why doesn't Sunnyvale add plastic bags to their, to, for recycling? Um, some big, some uh, big box stores allow this since there's a market for them. Plastic bags are a tough topic. Um, there was for a while, a, and maybe, maybe it has come back, a state law that required groceries to accept plastic bags. Um, now the previous incarnation of the law, this is a little bit of a story, so bear with me. The previous incarnation of the law required the stores of a certain size to collect the bags, recycle them, keep records on who recycled them and how much they weighed and report that information. And we had a staff member go around and very diligently go to all eight stores in Sunnyvale that qualified for this law. And not a single one of them could produce records on what they had done with the bags. A couple of them very candidly said, we take the bags from the container in front. We don't have a market for them. We put them in the trash container behind the store. One that my favorite one was a guy who said, um, this is quite a few years ago, said, uh, well, I walk them across the street to Safeway and put it in their container. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny um, for this one of the eight stores. So it is a great mystery and Safeway won't let us in their facility. Uh, our industry trade group has tried for years to try to get into the big Safeway facility over by Patterson uh, or south of Tracy to see how they do what they claim they do, but they won't show us. Um, so that makes me very suspicious that there's not a lot of positive things being done with plastic bags, but that's just a supposition and I don't really know. Um, I know that plastic bags in industrial settings are recycled um, 
uh, where you're generating them, say in a warehouse where uh, pallets come with shrink wrap on them, that stuff gets captured a lot of it and gets recycled and probably makes up the majority of the plastic, uh, flexible plastic wrap that is uh, recycled in the US. Most consumer bags are very difficult. If there's a paper receipt in the bag, that could weigh as much as the bag or almost as much as the bag and be a serious contaminant. If there's moisture or a little food in the bag, you know, the mass of that moisture or food could be close to as much um, mass as the plastic itself. And you can see that would lead to serious contamination problems in a manufacturing process. Great, thank you for answering that. That's uh, unfortunate to hear about the bags. Um, all right, our next question. Can you expand more on the anticipated rollout of composting at apartment complexes and multi-unit, multi-home units? Yeah, so we're just uh, starting to plan that program um, and our hauler, specialty um, staff and city staff will be going out to visit all of the apartment complex uh, managers or facil facilities folks to talk to them about where recycling carts could be, uh, food scraps carts could be placed um, so that it's easy for residents to get to them. And then we'll be providing outreach to um, all the residents as, along with a, a countertop pail. Um, so you'll receive that um, before January of 2022, hopefully if everything goes well. Um, and you'll be hearing more about the program uh, the closer we get to January. So that's, um, that's in the works now. We, we have quite a few complexes. I think there's over a thousand um, residents that would be getting this program. So it's, it's quite a big lift, but we're excited. Great, awesome. Thanks for sharing that update, Karen. Um, all right, let's see. Um, all right, I see so much wish cycling or just incorrect items going into container bins. What else can be done to educate people? You know, with education, you just have to repeat it. You just have to keep at it. Um, I'm sure everyone on this call tonight probably learned one or two new things about the materials um, that they've been wish cycling. So we just have to keep telling people um, how to recycle right. Um, our goal is to, you know, to make sure they understand and, and really to try to simplify things as much as possible so that it's not so complicated. Um, so that was our goal uh, with both the Dirty Dozen and the Nice Nine um, to try to just simplify it down to the basics. Um, so you don't have to like do as much standing in front of the recycling cart as, um, as you used to. So if you memorize all those, then you'll, you'll get much better at it. But tell all your friends and you know, we continue to push out um, social media and other um, information uh, like generally on monthly um, to let people know about, you know, specific items that we find problematic. So we just have to keep repeating. Thank you, Karen. Yes, uh, share what you've learned tonight with uh, your family and your friends and other Sunnyvale community members. Um, all right, next question. Will something replace the numerical recycle triangles currently on plastic containers? I don't think so. I mean, as far as I know, if, they, if they're not gonna be required, and Mark, please jump in if you know more about this. Um, if they're not gonna be, if it, did you hear the, the question? question. It replace, something replace what? Yeah, are Those, they going to replace the number, like the, you know, the arrows like with symbol. the numbers, yeah. Uh, I think, the problem with the numbers could remain. It was the uh, having the, the uh, recycling triangle was the part that was misleading consumers. So I think the state law says you, you can use the numbers. You just can't. And you could even put a triangle, I suppose, around them, but you couldn't put the recycling symbol around them. Gotcha. Um, OK, so a question about Amazon padded packages. Um, are any parts of these recyclable, no parts? Yeah, that's the question. So we talked to, I don't know, Mark, if you know more about this, but um, the last time I talked to our the smart station guy who does the marketing, he said he didn't like those things. Um, I actually took them apart and in the middle, it looks like there's some, oh, maybe Mark has one. It almost looks like there's little 
pieces of styrofoam in between the two layers of the paper. I commend Amazon for turning, you know, their horrible plastic one into a paper envelope, but I'm not so sure the glue I'm guessing is what it is or the padding is recyclable. It looks like styrofoam to me. I'm going to the bag of shame here. And so here's, here's the shameful one. Um, this is the plastic one. I don't know if that's the one the questioner is asking about. Um, They're talking about the and, paper one. Okay, uh, and they say the plastic is recyclable, but you have to take the label off. But that really requires taking scissors and cutting that whole square off. And, and then you're back to the, where do I take it? Because it's really the same stuff that uh, goes with plastic bags. So let's, let's call this the shameful one. Then there's an intermediate one that looks on the outside like it's recyclable, but it has, I don't know if the camera is picking this up well, but it has a plastic inner liner with pop, pop beads. Mm. And you can, I'm trying to pop the pop beads to make create sound effects. I like the effect. Yeah, so that's definitely a no. But the good one is this, and this might be the one Karen's talking about, but it, yeah. I think it's all fiber. And as far as I can tell, it's perfectly acceptable. If you rip it open, this is like a starch material that's not going to create problems in the paper making process. All that's right. A good shot of it. So These we'll say cool. yes. These we'll say good. yes on that one. And, and it's interesting to, to mention the Amazon folks have come out and toured the smart station. They have looked at the physics that um, is used to process materials in our industry. And there's some people at Amazon really trying very hard uh, to make their output more environmentally um, acceptable or less damaging, more recyclable. So, so I have to give a shout out to, to those individuals in Amazon, that team that, that really is looking on the ground at how, where this stuff goes in the real world and how it's really handled and where it really ends up. Um, and they are, uh, I think internally at Amazon, uh, making some good changes or trying to make some good changes and, and push that stuff up their chain of command. Yeah, I think one of the things, you know, we we're talking about how do you get producers to or, or, you know, stores to change the kinds of products they take that are not recyclable. And if you brought them out to the smart station, it would probably make a world of difference. I think the Amazon folks were appalled to see all the blue envelopes just coming across the line and going straight to the landfill. So it made quite an impact on them from what I remember. And, you know, if stores could see, you know, all the clamshells and other packaging that comes out um, with their name on it, uh, they might, you know, they might change their tune. So it should be mandatory. We should make mandatory tours for all these folks, all the store owners or producers. It's really the producers, not the store owners. All right. It is. 8.27, so we've got just a couple minutes left. So I'll try to squeeze in one or two more questions. Um, this should be a simple one. Do I need to remove the staples from tea bags before putting them in the food scrap bin? I'd say if it's easy to take it out, you can, but if not, uh, that material gets screened out at the other end. I try to pull mine out. Once they're wet, you can kind of just yank it out. Awesome. Um, all right, let's see. Um, where can I find out about which stores are using more or more and less environmentally, I think this means environmentally damaging packaging? Really, you have to kind of know what, what stuff isn't good and what is. So it's kind of, I think, more up to the consumer. Um, I mean, the farmer's market is a good place to go because there's not much packaging there. You know, you can bring your own containers and just leave all the packaging behind. So, um, you know, any place where there's open bins with produce where you can just pick it yourself. And like when I go to Trader Joe's, I don't even, I just put all my limes in my basket. I don't even put them in a bag. I don't use bags anymore. You can buy produce bags and use produce, you know, reusable produce bags, things like that. Um, but I think as a consumer, some of the, the onus is on you to sort of um, not buy the things that are overpackaged, tell the store if you don't like it, and bring your reusable containers or produce bags if you can. Emma, I see a good question from, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Ray's, some shooting. 
about um, excess edible foods. Karen's been working on stuff that she could comment about on at the county level. You see that at 8.14 p.m.? Yeah, so part of that law that I was talking about um, requires um, commercial sites really and caterers, anyone who's got uh, excess food to start donating it if they are not. Um, the county is actually working that on this on, the, on a countywide basis. So um, each business will be contacted. Um, well, there's, there's different tiers. There's uh, large like supermarkets, um, universities, um, uh, commercial kitchens, things like that. That will be in tier one and tier two is gonna be smaller smaller places that might generate edible food. And so I think tier one is in, uh, has to have something in place by 2022 and the tier two is in 2024. So they will be contacted by either city staff or county staff. Uh, city staff really probably will be uh, reaching out to everyone who um, falls into those categories um, to find ways um, for them to get their edible food um, donated. Great, that's awesome to hear. Thanks for sharing that, Karen. Um, all right, so we are at 8.30. Um, so we're going to wrap up now, but thank you everyone for all of your questions. Um, you can check that the Q&A. Some of your questions might have, we might have typed an answer. Um, and again, if we were not able to answer something that you wanted to get, get the answer to, you're always able to email us um, at green at sunnyvale.ca.gov and we can try to answer your question later on. Um, the recording of this presentation will be shared and posted online in a couple days. Um, we will send out a follow-up email when the recording is available and you'll be able to access it online. Um, we want to remind you to please fill out our feedback survey. Um, Madeline will hopefully send that link through the Q&A. We'll also be sending it in the follow-up email as well. Um, it'd be really great to hear your feedback. It'll be super short, it'll only take about three minutes. Um, and so you can provide feedback on this event and what your thoughts were. Um, thank you again so much to Mark and Karen. It was great to have you. This talk was super informative and we got to answer tons of questions. So we really appreciate your time and your expertise. And lastly, um, we have one more upcoming event that you wanna highlight. It is next Monday, May 24th. 7 to 8 p.m. It is an electric vehicle workshop called EV201, Finding the Electric Vehicle for Your Lifestyle. So if you're curious about electric vehicles, um, you want to learn more about incentives, um, what it means to purchase one, different types of models, you can check out that event. And we will also be sending out um, the link to register as well. So thank you everyone again for attending. Um, this was a wonderful event. And we hope you enjoyed it and that you learned something. And as Karen said, that you share one new piece of information with, um, with someone new to spread this, the word about um, busting all those recycling myths. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye, thanks for your time. Thank you everyone.